Hi, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 Self-Direction Virtual Conference Series. My name is Casey DeLuca, and I'm the Director of Membership and Conferences for Applied Self-Direction. Thank you so much for joining us today for our second session on veteran-directed care called Person-Centered Counseling Practices and Invoicing Strategies for Veteran-Directed Care. I'm going to run through just a few quick housekeeping issues before we begin. You can submit your questions and comments at any time during the session by using the Q&A pod in the lower left-hand corner of the Adobe Room. If you experience any audio or technical issues during today's presentation, you can send us a message, again, by either using that Q&A pod or emailing us at info at AppliedSelfDirection.com. I am excited to welcome back our speakers for today, Pat Brady and Dan Sheps. Pat Brady is a managing consultant with the Lewin Group, where he works with both the VA and the Administration for Community Living on veteran-directed care. We also have Dan, who is the National Program Officer for all long-term care services provided by the VA, including the veteran-directed care program. So with that being said, I will turn things over to Pat to get us started. Thank you, Casey, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's just a pleasure to be here and to talk about one of the most important programs that are available to veterans, their caregivers, as well as their families, and that's Veteran Directed Care, or VDC. Before I jump right into it, I just want to take a moment to, to thank Applied Self-Direction ASD for having both Dan and I here today for continuing to support veteran directed care, VDC providers, as well as FMSs and the critical roles that they play in serving veterans in VDC. We were here a couple, couple weeks ago to talk about veteran directed care globally. And today we'll be focusing more about person-centered counseling or PCC practices. It's one of the most critical and foundational components of self-direction and veteran-directed care, and we want to talk about how this fits within the program. Before we do that, just looking at the opening poll that we had and who's here. So when we think about person-centered counseling or PCC practices, very frequently it's associated with the role of the Aging and Disability Network Agency, the ADNA, or most commonly the VDC provider. But these person-centered practices, these PCC practices, they really permeate throughout veteran-directed care. It touches the role of medical centers, the role of the person-centered counselor or options counselor, whatever you may call them at the VDC provider, the role of FMSs in supporting veterans and caregivers, and most importantly, it has to do with putting the veteran, the family member, at the center of this program so that it works. It also recognizes some of the important and critical roles of our stakeholders in recognizing the benefit of PCC, so whether that's VA Medical Center leadership, ACL, the regional offices that support veteran-directed care, state governments that we know that still um, are, are just thrilled that entities within their states have the opportunity to, to deliver this service. So within PCC, what are we going to talk about today? We're going to, we're going to start just by trying to define person-centered counseling in PCC. What do we, what do we mean when, when we say that? A little disclaimer, I am not the expert here. Um, I, I, I want to be totally transparent about that. I've had the, the pleasure of learning from people like Merle Edwards Orr and Sean Terrell from ACL and other people about what does PCC and how does it work and why is it critical in VDC. And we're going to talk about why is it important for veteran directed care. But this isn't intended to be um, a session on how to do person-centered counseling. We're then going to talk about different responsibilities, procedures, and policies within VDC by stakeholder groups. And how does PCC permeate and resonate throughout everything that we do in veteran-directed care? And then from there, 
what we're going to spend most of our time talking about is strategies to improve, not improve person-centered counseling. It's actually how can we adhere to rules and policies and procedures within VDC and make sure that everything that we do, that, that person-centered care that's delivered is clear and documented because we know it exists. We know it's out there. We see it every day. But how can we make sure that these different touch points that we have for VDC, how can we make sure that that person-centered care and what that means for the veteran is is seen in the spending plan, is seen in their service report, is seen in the monthly and quarterly follow-up that occurs. And then we're going to try to move at a little bit of a faster pace so that there's actually time for Q&A at the end, which we ran out of time before. So let's start. What is, what is PCC and why is it important? So there's, I, I've learned that there's, there's really no consensus, no one definition in, in the dictionary for person-centered counseling or PCC, but there are some very common principles to describe PCC. And some of those principles include focusing on the person. So this means listening to what a person is saying and validating that you heard them. It means that services that are being delivered should reflect individuals' desires, preferences, culture. It should include people who are important in a person's life. It also has to deal with choice and self-determination. So we want people to make decisions about their own life. It includes their health, their services, their supports, their well-being. And we're there to support them with these choices in self-determination. We talk about what's important to an individual. It could be going grocery shopping. It could be seeing a grandson's ball game. That's important to a person. And then important for a person. Is it being more independent? Is it living healthier? Is it living independently? The importance for the veteran. Last couple things, community inclusion. Individuals aren't limited to what's inside their residences, particularly when they have challenges living independently. We want to promote access to the community. And then the availability of supports and services. I'm thinking here about a graphic that Applied Self-Direction and Merle has used over the years that has meant a ton to me. And it's the availability of services and supports. We want people to have access to an array of services and supports that meet their needs. So we don't give them a menu. We have them make informed choices on how they want to use their budget. It helps them accomplish their goals and meet their needs. And we have the pleasure, I have the pleasure, of continually being reminded of the benefits of person-centered counseling for individuals. And that's what the rest of this slide visualizes. We have Tommy Atchison on, on the top left. We have uh, another, another video. Um, I'm sorry, I actually got it backwards. Uh, we have a veteran in San Diego on the top left, and then Tommy Atchison on the top right. There was an amazing event in Mechanicsville, Virginia, uh, that has the bottom two pictures there, where veterans enrolled, their caregivers enrolled in BDC, came and talked about their experiences. We have a recent example from Carrie White, who talked about her daughter's experience in veteran-directed care and living as independently as possible with the support of family, friends, and caregivers. And we have a ton of quotes. We have uh, research, it changed everything. We have a recent webinar by Callie Thomas and Ellen Mahoney that talked about veterans and caregivers. So suffice it to say, we have all of these examples of why person-centered counseling is so important to self-direction and BDC. And we're just calling a few of those out here today. So now we, we've talked a little about, about what person-centered counseling is. Why is it important to VDC? And, and Dan, I'm wondering if you want to you wanna answer and talk about that question a little bit. Sure. Thank you, Patrick. Um, 
we do get uh, asked about veteran-directed care and person-centered counseling uh, quite a bit. And, and I think at times when, when we're engaged in the program that we can forget how radically different this program is from anything else that the VA does in long-term services and supports. In this program, veterans have budget and employer authority and, and really have a great deal to say, control over the services they receive and, and when they receive them. And that's just not available elsewhere in, in VA on, on the healthcare side. We're not set, we're not set up like that. Um, and we look at, well, why is veteran directed successful? And we think it's some combination, uh, and when I say successful, you know, there's been early report, you know, a, a Lewin report from 2017 um, found large reductions in institutional care. Um, a more recent report by uh, Health Services uh, Research found uh, found similar, confirmed those results, not to the extent that the Lewin Group had, but but certainly that the, the trend of that information. Um, we know from an audit uh, that will be released uh, next month by the Office of Inspector General, uh, giving the program a clean bill of, of health. Um, that the program is successful and and we get credit from AARP for supporting uh, person-centered counseling early on um, uh, for for the aging population. Um, we know that veterans in in the program in VDC are more medically complex than veterans in other HCBS programs, and and that has been our um, that has been why we've we've invested um, in partly in the in the uh, uh, in in patient centered person centered excuse me person centered counseling um, because these veterans need more help and person-centered counselors are extensions of, of the VA uh, in providing support to veterans in their homes and, and their communities. Um, so I think it's, it's important that we not underestimate or understate um, what goes on in in person centered counseling and, and we we really believe that it's a, a combination of of shrewd targeting uh, of of veterans to to enroll in the program on the part of the medical center and then what goes on through the person centered planning process that has that has provided uh, the success that we've seen that that has made this um, uh, such a uh, such a remarkable uh, such a remarkable program and Patrick I will turn it back to you Or do I? No, I go on. Uh, I'm doing this slide. OK. We want to take this moment to announce uh, that there are new 
resources that are coming out uh, tomorrow, as a matter of fact. Uh, they'll be posted on the ACL website um, that touches on the topics that that we'll, we'll be speaking to uh, uh, further on. Uh, there will be a new uh, billing and invoicing guide uh, uh, published tomorrow. This is a guide that has been reviewed and received the imprimatur of, of the Payment Operations Management Group, the Office of Community Care. We're very excited uh, uh, to uh, uh, to have this guide uh, that's you know ECAM based, uh, which is our payment system, um, and know that it will be helpful to everybody. Um, there will be a new template released tomorrow on spending plans. We're going to be counting on spending plans more and more, uh, and uh, particularly important with the changes we've we've made and in how we look at spending plans. This will be, uh, we know this will be a big help. And then uh, we've improved, we believe we've improved the monthly services report. So the information coming back to the medical center is, you know, is what it needs. It's helpful in, uh, you know, watching what's going on in the program for an individual veteran. Um, as well as to uh, uh, point out issues that that working jointly, um, the VDC provider and the medical center all uh, can resolve. So uh, it's a very exciting veteran-directed week for us. Now I'll turn it over to Patrick. Thanks, Dan. So we talked about PCC, highlighted some resources that are going to come out in support of policies and procedures for veteran-directed care, making those clear, but also embodying some of those principles of self-direction. So let's take a moment, and we want to hear from you. If you're a medical center, we want to hear from you. If you're a VDC provider, we want to hear from you. If you're a veteran, if you're a family member on the call, we want to hear from you. Where do you document the value and impact of person-centered counseling for VDC? We don't mean, you know, where do you say how great a person is. What we mean is, you know, what, is, what does person-centered counseling mean for you? Where does it hit you the most? And how do you document that? So, so let's take a moment and hoping everyone can participate. We don't get to move on to the rest of the presentation until we hear from at least some of you. That's great case notes. Monthly reports, probably monthly service reports. We call them MSRs typically. I don't have a list of participants, but maybe we should call people by name. Cost analysis, yeah. So Dan mentioned that BDC, there's no other program like it in terms of having access to person-centered care. As an FMS, I don't do this. I'm going, I'm, I'm hopefully going to convince you otherwise. If you're, if you are thinking that you don't do this, regardless of where you're from, my goal here is at the end to have you convinced otherwise. So we'll, we'll come back to that. Performance measures, success stories, yes, person-centered plan. This is great, thank you. I love these. So, as we go through the rest of the presentation, take a moment, think through, is there an opportunity for me to, to do things a little bit differently, maybe to further drive person-centered care, PCC, to make it more clear when PCC impacts what you do or what it means for veterans or caregivers. So keep that in the back of your mind. We're, we're gonna come back to that. We're gonna jump to the next slide now. And we're going to start talking about the intersection by stakeholder of person-centered counseling. Let's start with veterans and employees. So what do we mean by this? What we're really talking about here is 
the rules, the responsibilities, the requirements of EDC, we have to follow them. But how do we do them in a way that keeps us true to what self-direction means, which means empowering individuals to make informed decisions based on their preferences, their needs, their, their goals for independent living. So let's start by talking about veterans, which in parentheses here, we, we really do intend to also talk to authorized representatives if that's needed, and engaging caregivers, because we know that caregivers should be included in these discussions. And what we know is that enrolling in BDC is not simple. In fact, if you compare it to, you know, receiving typical agency care, it can be overwhelming and daunting. So one thing that we do by offering person-centered care to veterans is to empower them, to take control, to be engaged in assessments, in monitoring, in identifying goals, which, by the way, could very well be the first time someone ask them this question, what is your goal for independent living? Hopefully at this stage of healthcare they are hearing that, but many times they haven't, and many times they haven't heard it in their home before. We want veterans to be active. We want them to be vocal. And person-centered counseling, person-centered care sets the stage and creates this environment. And it's not all about feeling and emotion behind self-direction, which is that important, but this is also about practical guidance through PCC. What's the expectations of, ve of veterans and caregivers and their authorized reps? What does it mean to be an employer, to be responsible for designing a plan? What do they have to do in terms of setting employer agreements, hiring workers, completing timesheets? Even if veterans have managed people in the past, probably haven't managed someone providing personal care services, which is private, which is personal for the individual. What does it mean to be an employer in those situations? And PCC helps the veteran work through that. For employees, we don't talk about this enough, I think. But BDC providers, and this is one example of FMS providers playing a critical role, the way in which they advise employees to help make VDC operate seamlessly for the benefit of veterans. So does the employee understand the services that they're providing? Do they understand their hours, their set schedule? Hey, you're supposed to work 7 to 11. Here are the things the veteran needs help with. Are we going to help train you on delivering that care, on completing timesheets? Why is it important to accurately and timely complete those timesheets? How is it important to the veteran and to us in helping manage this program for you? And last, employees, that, especially for veterans living independently, they're the closest person to the veteran. So PCC, whether you're the FMS or the ADNA, you're educating employees on the veteran's needs. You're educating them on what to do in certain situations to identify changes, to manage risk. And in, any, in instances when it's needed, to communicate with the employer to the VDC provider if there's something going on. And that's really going to be a strength of the program. Okay. Now let's talk about the provider. There are also critical steps where PCC is integrated into the provider's processes. And we've listed some of them here, referral and intake the first opportunity to build trust and rapport. These practices, PCC practices, are probably most evident in the in-home assessment. I'm going to scroll over that one just for a moment because we will come back. But we've seen some very strong PCC principles built into processes for developing the spending plan, for reviewing the monthly service report, for conducting monthly and quarterly follow-up. So a couple of examples of that. There are VDC providers that use monthly service reports, those reports that summarize in detail spending that occurred within a given month. 
So they review those and they structure conversations with veterans to proactively identify challenges adhering to a spending plan or identifying maybe if the spending plan isn't working and needs to be tweaked. We've also been impressed to learn how some providers do their follow-up. The amount of preparation to go into these meetings with a game plan, so making sure it's individualized. You may have the same five questions for every monthly follow-up, but you shouldn't be asking those questions the same way in every conversation. It should be individualized. We should be documenting these conversations to understand changes longitudinally. This can be really important to identifying changes over time. Maybe the veteran needs a new case mix. And for some of our programs that have been around, it's great to have programs that have now been around for over a decade. We strongly encourage you to always consider your program level documents, your policies, your procedures, your veteran handbook. They're living documents. They'll, they'll need to be evolving. We have a number of programs that really make concrete, um, take concrete action to continually revisit and update these materials so that it, it matures with the program over time. And then the medical center has some PCC practices as well within their responsibilities. And Dan, I'll let you hit on those. Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, the medical center's responsibilities here are reviewing and uh, approving uh, spending plans, uh, reviewing monthly services reports, uh, and then uh, on generally an, an annual basis, uh, providing uh, reauthorizations uh, for for care uh, with a new with a new case mix. So the case mix has to be uh, completed um, uh, annually. Uh, it's done twice in the uh, in the first year of the uh, authorization. Um, so what I think what we what we want to focus or, or where our focus today is these are excellent places of not the reauthorizations but the spending plan and the and the monthly services reports uh, uh, to make known uh, the influence of of person-centered counseling, uh, that this particularly the spending plan is where that comes across. So these are more in 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 our minds more than you know just meeting the administrative requirements of of the program. Everybody has to submit a spending plan. Everybody has to uh, submit a monthly service report uh, for uh, for each veteran. But uh, it's, it's really, we, we don't want to lose the opportunity to point out how, how person-centered counseling has influenced uh, both of, of these reports for, uh, for veterans. So I think that's, uh, that's a really important important point and and a key opportunity uh, to bring to the medical center's attention this is what uh, person-centered counseling is is about um, and this is why the that spending plan looks this way for this spectrum um, it, I think it's a real key and I, I don't I don't want us to lose or uh, that opportunity to make that point. Patrick, I think we're back to you. Yes, and, but then only for only for uh, a moment. So don't go, don't go too far. We're gonna we're gonna switch gears. So we talked about some of we talked about the intersection. So we talked about some of the the responsibilities, the requirements for VVC. Now we're going to go through and talk more about best practices that we've had the opportunity to witness, to, to learn about from you all on the, on the call um, and others out there who aren't able to be here. Um, 
we're going we're gonna to share those. And if you think about this next, you know, 29 minutes that we have, you know, keep in the back of your mind what incremental changes can we continually make to improve the experience the, the, the experience of VDC for veterans and caregivers. So that's really what we're talking about. I don't think a lot of what we're going to share here is particularly new, particularly innovative. I think, again, it's, it's incremental. It's, it, there are things that we have learned are impactful for local VDC programs that they have done, and we want to share those. We think that, in addition, a lot of this will speak to the partnership between providers and medical centers, which evaluators, which you all have shared, is, is the foundational component for a program being successful. The foundational component for a program being successful for veterans and caregivers. Um, a lot of times we, we talk about being successful in terms of the, the medical center's lens, or the provider's lens, but in reality, as payer and provider, we need to be working collaboratively to, to understanding each other's perspective, which are going to be very different culturally, environmentally. So what are some strategies we can do to always make sure that we're seeing the world through each other's lenses in a way that benefits veterans and caregivers in VDC? We did get a very great question, uh, and really it wasn't a question. I think it was, it was more of a comment um, from, from a VDC provider who uh, mentioned that they have a, a, a guide to being an employer of record. So most commonly that will be the veteran. Sometimes it will be an authorized representative. And what it means in a program like VDC. And what they shared was, you know, that's going to be the opportunity to sit down to figure out if VDC is right for them. Because it's not always going to be right. We're there to help the veteran understand if this program is right for them. We're making referrals based on a judgment that it could be. But that's not always going to be the case. So that was a great example of how they structured that initial guide to be able to communicate that, to give veterans, their family members, resources to understand it, to make informed decision about whether or not BDC is right. And at this stage, it happens before the veteran is even actively enrolled in using their budget. So I, I just really liked that example. And if you have other examples and if you have any questions, please do use the, the Q&A box. We're going to have some time at the end. Um, okay, so that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, Dan, I'm going to let you begin by talking about global budget. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, we have made the shift uh, away from uh, monthly budgets, uh, although they are they are uh, useful for for planning, but they're not set in stone. We're really looking at the totality of the budget for the period of of the authorization, and and two side points there. Uh, the total amount of the authorization cannot be exceeded. If it is, VA cannot pay. So if, if, if a, a veteran, and this should never happen because we have all these safeguards, um, but if a veteran runs over the authorization, there is nothing VA can do. Um, uh, you know, someone else, the veteran, uh, someone is is going to have to pay for that overage. The VA cannot exceed its its authorization levels. Um, another quick point I'll make uh, in this: if by chance you receive a consult that speaks to a monthly budget amount. Get on the phone with your coordinator and have them uh, and have them amend that consult um, to give the global budget amount, 
not the monthly budget amount. Because if you run over a monthly budget amount that's in the consult, it's, um, uh, it's an improper payment. You'll still get paid, but we will, I mean, the medical center will have incurred unintentionally an improper payment. So just make sure to safeguard everybody, the medical center, in case they weren't quite, quite paying attention. Uh, that you need on the consult if in fact that's where the uh, the budget information is passed to you that that is the global budget amount for the period of the authorization not a monthly amount that the auditor is going to hold you to um, for uh, uh, for purposes of, of improper payments all right those that's kind of a uh, an aside one of my jobs is is improper payments, so I'm like sensitive to that. Um, so uh, the monthly budget in amount does not apply anymore for for billing and invoicing. Um, it's it's really and this this increases the importance of of the monthly services report. Uh, so that that coordinator can monitor what's actually going on, uh, and and you know you're the monitor that FMS is monitoring a, as well. Um, with uh, a global budget, plan savings uh, goes away. Um, if a veteran needs something, that should be in the spending plan uh, for the period of the authorization and should proceed uh, with the purchase when uh, when that is needed. Um, and all spending has to be in the spending plan. Uh, another uh, key element, there can't be uh, anything missing or anything understood. If, if, uh, if it's not in the spending plan, we can't, we can't pay for it. Um, this changes uh, uh, the relationship of uh, and and the nature of of the spending plan and 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 how to work with this uh, strategically and that may not be a particular strength of of the veteran or the authorized representative. Um, so it's okay to build this uh, on a monthly basis, which is perhaps easier to think about. Um, but as it's as it's displayed, it might be easier to think about it on a weekly basis. But as it displays and as you build it, it builds to uh, a global budget, and that's how it has to be um, expressed. So. Much more emphasis on on the spending plans, and again, we think the new uh, documents that get released tomorrow are going to be helpful to the ADNAs in in this regard, and also the the monthly services reports. Again, we think will be more helpful for the uh, uh, for the ADNA, um, uh, the FMS, and the uh, 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 and the VAMC uh, because they have to uh, they have to review these um, uh, plans and I think I have one more slide in this set so there's a, another change here um, before what our the primary goal was to make sure that uh, the veteran spending was below or did not exceed the monthly budget amount, uh, and 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 that could be difficult. That could be hellish at at times, um, and and we have a long experience with. Um, uh, with denials because it was bumping up against the, the fee schedule and uh, it, it just that just did not work 
Um, now the goal is to maximize the delivery of services and goods over the period of the authorization without exceeding that um, uh, the, the, the total authorization for the period. And that total authorization is a very hard number. Patrick, back to you. Thanks, Dan. Got a couple couple questions. Maybe we can just tackle one of them real quick. What is the time frame for a global budget? Maybe Dan, I'll just hit on this real quick and you can you can add to it. The time frame for a global budget is the P 